The word for our time. The word for our time. The word for our time. Welcome to the Words for Our Time podcast. This is the first recording of our podcast, and we praise God that you're joining us. My name is Adrell Lewis, and it's a privilege to study the Word of God with you today. The purpose of this podcast is to bring the truth of the Bible into our current time. In our day and age, there is so much information, but even more misinformation. Now that may not matter when we are trying to figure out what's the best basketball shoes to wear or the best Italian restaurant to eat at, but it's critical when we're thinking thinking about the purpose God has for our lives. Or maybe when we're thinking about, can I trust the Bible or not? Or if we're thinking about, is there only one true religion? And what will happen before Jesus comes back? In these instances, having the right information is critically important. And having the wrong information can totally alter how we see God and religion itself. In fact, we're going to talk about that more in our study today. The goal of these 15 to 20 minute podcasts is to help you, the listener, have a better understanding of the truth of the Bible and of its originator, Jesus Christ. We do plan on studying topics that are unique, deep, and look at the Bible in a way that maybe you haven't looked at it before. This is a Bible-based study, so it's a good idea to have your Bible in hand, and don't forget to always invite a friend. So today, in our first lesson, we're studying on the topic, The First Lie Ever Told. We live in a time of technological advancements. I'm sure that right now you're listening to me on maybe a phone or a laptop or a tablet or some other device, and it's incredible that what you have in your hand or what you have in your lap used to fit in the size of a living room. This is a incredible technological advancement that we have in our days. And technology is increasing more and more and more. But not only that, we have political strife happening across the world, cultural shifts, environmental concerns, and economic inequality. All of these things seem to be happening at once. Needless to say, there's a lot of problems that need to be addressed. But is this what God had planned for the human race? What was God's original design? If we read the creation creation story in Genesis, we see the plan that God had for us. We see that the life we are living is not at all what God had intention for us. God wanted no death, no sickness, no pain, no suffering. But we have that. We have death. We have sickness. We have pain. We have suffering. God wanted no famines and homelessness, but we have famines and we have homelessness. God wanted a perfect environment, but we have natural disasters. God wanted equality, but we have inequality. God wanted peace, and we have wars. God wanted joy and happiness, but we have depression and and, and anxiety. None of this is in accordance to what God's original plan was. So if God is so powerful, and he, if, if, if God is so powerful and so loving and so knowing, then why are we here? Why are we in this predicament that we're in if this was not God's plan? Well, this question has been asked since the time of humankind. And it's also been answered many, many times. We'll try to find an answer for that today. But first, let's give an illustration. Just imagine. Imagine you're a married couple trying to have kids. And you finally have a beautiful daughter. You love your daughter unconditionally. You do everything in your power to show your love, to show this love that you have for her, this incredible love that's in your heart. However, even with this environment, Somehow your daughter grows up to hate you, like really hate you. Now you, you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out. You decide to buy her whatever she wants. Whatever she asks for, you buy it for her. And she hates you even more. 
then you decide, okay, you know what? Let me flip the strip. Let me flip the script here. I'm not going to buy her anything and see if that helps, but she still hates you. You decide, you know what? It's not money that she wants. What she wants is quality time. You, de you decide to, de to spend quality time with your daughter and it doesn't work. Then you decide, okay, let me flip the script again. Let me actually give her space and leave her alone. But she hates you still. You tell her every day that you love her. It doesn't work. Nothing seems to be working. Then you hear about a new invention. It's actually a microchip. A microchip, a, a, a microchip that you can implant into a child's head and it will force that child to love you. It will force that child to love its parents. You quickly sign up for this procedure. You go to the doctor, you forcibly bring her, and they do the surgery. You are waiting in the waiting room thinking, wow, this is the right decision, I don't know, but I, I had nothing else that I could have done. And she finally comes out. And right away, she says, I love you, dad. I love you, mom. And gives you guys a big hug. Now, at first you think, this is great. You ask your daughter just on the way home, you ask her just to, just to test it out. You ask her, hey, um, daughter, do you love me? And she replies immediately, yes, father. I love you, father. I love you, mom. And every time you ask her, she always responds, yes. But what you will slowly or maybe even quickly learn is that she doesn't really love you. She's only saying that because there's a microchip implanted in her head that's forcing her to say, I love you, dad. I love you, mom. And give you a big hug. This isn't love. This is not love at all. This is forced love. And in fact, you'll learn the lesson about love, which is that forced love is not love at all. Now comes the great lesson that God is trying to teach us, that love requires choice. Love requires choice. Love that is forced is not love at all. Now can you see why God had to give Adam and Eve a tree of knowledge of good and evil? Why he had to give them choice? It was a very simple choice. Eat of any fruit of this garden, and there must have been hundreds, if not thousands. But just don't eat of this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here's your choice, Adam and Eve. Love requires choice. Sin had now entered into the universe. Lucifer, as we know, one of the covering cherubs of God, had decided in his own heart that he wanted to be like God and that he wanted adoration and worship, that he wanted to follow his own selfish desires instead of following God. We read, about it, we read about it in Isaiah 14. Let's turn to Isaiah 14. I'm going to read verse 12 to 14. It says, How art thou following? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the earth, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. You see, Satan had an eye problem. Satan had a selfish problem, a pride problem. God didn't give this to Satan. What he gave them was choice. And Satan chose not to serve God. Now that sin had entered into the universe, God had a choice to make. Now he could kill Lucifer and kill all the angels who decided to follow him. He could put a microchip in their mind <laughs> or of course just force, the, force Lucifer and force his angels to say, I love you, I love you. 
he could erase everyone's mind, force everyone to love him. Or he could respect their choices of his created beings and do his best to prove through following his love that there is a better way than Lucifer's way. You see, God decided to prove his love. To prove his love to his created beings so that they will choose him over Lucifer. And this was the beginning of what we call the great controversy, the great fight between God and Satan. One theology that says, follow God, for he is good and wants the best for you. He created you and wants nothing but peace, joy, health, and happiness for your life. And the other theology or ideology that says, follow your own selfish desires, follow your heart, do what you want. Don't submit yourself to God. So now as a test, so now a test had to be set up. Which one of these two ideals will Adam and Eve choose? God doesn't want to see his children suffer. But God as, but as, as God is, as a God that is all loving, he must allow all choice. And choices have consequences. Consequences that reverberate throughout generations. A trait that a father has now can affect his children and his children's children for generations. We often call this in our days generational curses or falling into generational cycles. You can imagine with all the sin done, done since the time Adam and Eve fit, um, ate the fruit and fell, there have been many generational curses and generational cycles that have come into the human condition. And now we see ourselves in the mess that we're in. But how did we get here? We got here because Adam and Eve, our ancestors, believed a lie. The first lie, actually, that was ever told to the human race. We read about it in Genesis chapter 3. Let's read Genesis chapter 3. We'll read verse 1 to 4. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither touch it, lest you die. And the serpent replied back to Eve and said, you shall not surely die. You see, this is the first lie told to our ancestors, that we will not surely die. It's not that you won't die, but it's that you won't really be dead. This lie brought into the human race the thought of an immortal soul. Since then, it has permeated the entire world and all cultures and beliefs. You see, the, the, the common beliefs of the immortal soul is that when you die, your soul still lives forever. Some people say it lives like a ghost floating around earth. Some say you get reincarnated into another animal or into another human being. Some say you go straight to hell or straight to heaven or in between into purgatory. Or there's many different versions of this, but it's that your soul doesn't die. Your soul is immortal. We see this in movies and television. They'll talk often about ghosts or zombies or some way that the soul cannot die. And oftentimes, even how we speak in common phrases, we'll say things like, oh, I must have known her in a past life. Or in cultures, we have many superstitions about the dead. We have Halloween and, you know, different stories we tell each other as children. These all stem from an idea that the soul is immortal, so it doesn't really die. It's floating around somewhere. In religion, we see this lie pop up too. Many Christian religions believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven to live forever in glory or straight to hell to burn forever in damnation. Now, don't get me wrong. Heaven is real. 
and the righteous will live forever with God. That is 100% true. But what about hell? And do we go to heaven right after we die? What about those who don't go to heaven? Well, to answer these questions, we must go to the Bible, the only source of truth, the Word of God. The Word of God alone is our standard of truth. Many times we want to go to sources outside of the Bible. And that's fine, as long as those sources agree with what the Bible says and not try to invent some new idea or a new way of interpreting the word. The Bible is extremely clear. Let's read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see, the soul is a combination of two things. The soul is body that was formed out of the dust of the ground, and the breath of life that comes from God. This equation, body plus the breath of life, equals a living soul. The soul isn't its own thing by itself. It's a combination of two things. And so what happens when, when we die? We read about it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It says there, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit return to God who gave it. You see, when the, you die, that equation of body plus spirit now breaks apart, and the body decomposes back to dust, and, this, and the breath of life, the, that energy that allows us to live, goes back to God. The body returns to dust from where it came. The breath of life returns to God from where it came. So then is the soul not immortal? Let's look, in, let's look more into it. Let's read Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul. In hell. Now, does that mean that God is able to destroy a soul? I thought the, the soul is impossible to be destroyed. The verse is clear. Now, who will inherit internal life? This is an important question. Of course, we know the righteous will inherit e eternal life, but aren't there many beliefs out there that say the wicked will also have eternal life? In hell, burning. Now, of course, having eternal life in hell is no, you know, is no nice thing. It's no wonderful life. You're not, you're not enjoying it at all. Of course not. But it is eternal life. Let's read what it says. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This famous verse is very clear that whoever believes in God will have everlasting life. Will the wicked have everlasting life burning in hell? Let's read Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, confirmation that eternal life is a gift of God through Jesus Christ. John chapter 5 verse 25 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So those that hear the voice of God, they're the ones who will live, not the ones who reject the voice of God. Romans chapter 2 verse 7, To them who are patient, continuance in well-doing, Seek, the, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now, who will receive immortality, eternal life? Who are patient and continuing in well-doing and seek for the glory of God. Verse 8, but unto them, this is Romans chapter 2, verse 8, but unto them which are contentious, contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. 
it is clear that only the righteous receive eternal life. Then why do we think often in Christianity that the wicked also receive eternal life in hell? I know it's thought of as burning and torment, but it's still eternal life in damnation. Well, this comes from the first lie. You see, the enemy told us that we won't surely die. And this became a belief that the soul is immortal. And many ancient philosophers like Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras believed that the soul is immortal. So it became a common belief in society, and it's found its way in religion as well. You see, we have some, some interesting verses. So let's read some verses that, that, that seem to contradict this. Matthew 25, verse 41, for example, it says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, unto everlasting fire, prepare for, pre prepared for the devil and his angels. For, and verse, if we skip down to 46, it says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous will live forever. Okay, well, it speaks about everlasting fire and everlasting punishment. So doesn't that just contradict what you said, Adrell? Let's continue to read. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? So these verses talking about everlasting destruction and everlasting fire will make it seem like, well, damnation, hell, is eternal, right? But the Bible must be read in its entirety to get an idea. You can't just pull a verse here and a pull, pull a verse there and make a doctrine. You got to look at multiple parts of the Bible to have understanding. If you read one verse by itself, you can have a very wrong understanding of what the Bible says. So let's make this clear. You see, there are other verses that we read that will give us some more clarity on this on this saying of everlasting fire or eternal fire or eternal damnation or everlasting damnation. If you, the Bible has no contradictions. We just read that only the righteous receive eternal life. So these other verses that say the wicked re receive eternal life, it cannot be a contradiction. We have to study more to understand what is being said. So let's, let's read. If we ponder this question, I'm going to read to you another verse. Jude chapter 1, verse 7. Jude chapter 1, verse 7 is kind of a key here that helps us un unlock what, what is said in, in those previous verses. But well, Jude chapter 1, verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember those cities, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of, what does it say there? Eternal fire. Suffering the vengeance, they are an example for us, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So wait a sec, is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? No. So what does the verse mean by eternal fire? Listeners, what it means is the consequences are eternal. There's no turning back from this destruction that happens. It's like me saying, if you invest your money in that bad idea, you're going to lose your money forever. You're going to lose your money eternally. Are you forever losing money <laughs> or are you just going to lose your money forever and it's never going to come back the money the, the, in that example it's the consequences that are forever the action op only happens once you see Sodom and Gomorrah were, were destroyed and they were destroyed once and the action was done once but the consequences were forever. They were never going to come back again. 
So this is the so this first lie has caused a lot of confusion. Confusion that we are still still dealing with today. The soul is not immortal and there's no such thing as a eternally burning hell. Let's not fall for the first lie. Now in our next study, we will be talking about the second lie in the topic the lie we all believe. God bless you until then. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us here together to study your word. Lord, you want to have us worship you and worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray to you, Father, that we won't fall for any lies, but we'll look for the truth, God. We know that if we believe in you and have faith in you, that we will live for all of eternity. And we look forward to that day. We thank you, God, for everything you've done for us. Continue to be with us and guide with us. Be with every listener here and all their families represented. And I pray to you that we will come together again to study your word for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Take care.